I don't know. It's odd that it's a movie where some people really do like it quite a lot, and so many others really hate it. But I do find that um, I've managed to keep a consistent run of that, um, just that kind of um, response over the years. You know, but the, the fact that people keep talking about it uh, must tell you something. Yeah, but well, what? I don't remember uh, where he got that from, wearing tape on your nose. I mean, why is that associated with some sort of disguise? Exactly. <laughs> Most of the people who are in the movie, we all met here at the Cosmic Cafe. It's like, like a neighborhood gang. <laughs> we become the gang. The whole one, his brother, and Apple Jack, the black guy. He was supposed to be driver. And I am supposed to be work the chef cracker. That was my job, to, to open the cracker. You know? and, and I get... My own line, I said, don't, don't rush me. I lose my touch. Well, I mean, listen, I, it was three days. It was like being, you know, the left-hand corner of the Hollywood Squares or something. I don't know, you know. I was just determined to make this film, Bottle Rocket. I had to get Jim down there to meet the boys. And we called them the Bottle Rocket Boys. When, when they said that uh, Jim Brooks is coming here, I was like, so you, when do we, we were living in Dallas. I said, well, so we're going to go get him at the airport. And they were like, no, he's coming here to where we lived. And we lived in a, this place was a hovel. It was a really squalid place. And uh, in fact, I got, I got p double pink eye one, one time during the winter, staying there with Owen and Luke. And I think Wes might have been in one of the one of the rooms, or might have been even in the same room with us. We were all sleeping in the same room for, for warmth. Virtually everybody in the movie was living in one apartment. And they had been living there for, you know, a long time. And they had had this script forever, but they had never read it out loud, despite the fact that all the lead actors were living in the same room. They had never read it out loud. So I said, let's read it out loud. And they said, okay. And we went to, I think, a hotel suite. You had to MC the thing, and you had to MC it by really giving a jolt of energy by reading the stage directions to make up for the fact that we didn't have much of a story, and you would really kind of... <laughs> and night came, and day broke, and seasons changed, and the calendar pages ripped off, and they were still... It was the longest reading. It, I, I, there was no clock on it. I didn't realize uh, what was going to happen. And nothing did happen, actually, for a long time. So the first thing was to cut, you know, the script. And there were scenes in it. For instance, um, the, the three lost boys are traveling around Dallas, and they hit the back of a car, and they have a really bad accident, and they get into a fist fight with the driver of the car, and then you never see those people again. You, you know, there was a character called Little Richard who comes in and fights with them, and you never see him again. That's it, fight, fight's over. And there were all these strange scenes that had to go, and getting Wes and Owen to cut those scenes was, I'm telling you, they were, I mean, I think, I don't know what they were thinking. I would love to know what they were thinking. Owen and me, we used to play 25 cents uh, a poker we play. And they play poker. Being shaggy dog friendly, I just make friends everywhere I go, you know. Kumar's the same way. So, uh, basically, it's going to be a pretty simple job, Mr. Kumar. We're going to be going in on a weekend night, you know, either a Friday or Saturday. We're going to make our way through the frozen section and uh, hit the safe. Uh, what do you want from me? Well, we hear that you're the best safe cracker in the Southwest. I think just maybe remember hearing that they were starting to write and I was just kind of surprised that it was all kind of real stuff, <laughs> you know, that... Uh, 
Yeah. Makes me seem like a regular guy. Owns a dog. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, you got them mixed up. Yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. We're rolling, still rolling. Okay. Okay, go. Yeah, yeah. But the thing is, you just got them mixed up. I do? Are yeah. Are you positive of that? Yeah, I'm positive. You just got the two of them confused. Well, Anthony, how do you know that you don't have them mixed up? Well, because probably my favorite episode, Starsky runs from payphone to payphone across the city to save his partner's life. Yeah, but how do you know that's not Hutch? That doesn't prove anything. That's what I'm getting to. Starsky is played by Paul Michael Glazer. Hutch is David Soule, blonde-headed one. Okay. Uh, I actually met Owen uh, around the corner at the pool table. And I think I won money from him the first night that we met. He sort of decided he wouldn't have to get a job at that point because whenever he, he uh, this is sort of pretty in line with the movie, uh, whenever uh, he needed money, he'd just come and uh, find me and we'd go play pool. Well, you know, that's what makes a horse race. And actually, Wes and I were standing right on that sidewalk, and Wes follows Jim across the street and says, so do we have a deal? So do we have a deal? I think Wes might have even done this thing where he puts his hand up on your shoulder like this. Jim said, yeah, we're committed to making the film, but the script needs work, and we're going to need to, do, to develop the script some. And it took two years. Two years. It might have been more than two years. I had a kind of blind belief that we were going to make the movie. I was, I mean, I really don't know that I had much choice. For us, it was, okay, it's a comedy, cost, you know, very little money, and uh, seemed like fun. I remember they gave us a first-class ticket uh, to fly from Dallas out there. And I remember trying to trade it in for a coach ticket. I'd never flown first class and trying to, you know, get the money, get the difference. And they told me, no, it'll get refunded to the credit card. So then I was like, well, I guess I'll fly first class then. We had to set them up in a uh, set of offices. I've never had offices like that again. We had a patio and we, there was a moped that we had. We had golf carts to drive around. We had a secretary. These are pretty good offices, and it's covered in uh, Owen's underwear, because <laughs> he was using it like semi as an apartment. And we, you know, we would go into our office and work every day. And Wes was just just had thousands of pictures posted on the wall, and you're just sitting there going like, "Well, what, what the hell are you guys doing?" And you know, and they says, "Well, you know, we're working." I think Jim may have said. You make sure they're okay and keep them writing, keep them working. Try to, because I feel like Jim might have sensed that we could probably get distracted and not um, pull through. Owen and Wes, as the writing team, would be in my office and we'd sit there for hours. And, and I'll never have that kind of session again because I pitch. I'm used to pitching. I come from television. I pitch ideas. And it would never be like, I don't know how they did it, because it would never be like you said something and you felt the silence so you were uncomfortable. But you never, they were a writing team, you never had any idea of how they were taking what you were saying. You just didn't. And I remember one time Jim saying, you know, I think it's kind of amazing that no one ever takes a note uh, in here and that kind of surprises. So then after that, we always came in with notebooks. I used to say they were like Quicksilver. You know, you couldn't get them in a room. Owen would wander off. Wes would wander off. And you had no problem uh, rising to the occasion. You were always demanding. As fast as I could. You were always kind of demanding in terms of pushing to get the green light from Jim, or if you wanted, you know, somebody would say, the producer, what do you need? And you'd ask for three tanks, uh, a couple helicopters, and this, and then say, okay, well, you'll, you can have a jet ski. And you say, okay, we'll make it work. Although Wes and Owen always seem like, even though they kind of do that kind of, aw shucks routine, those guys, those guys play possum a lot. They know exactly what they're doing. He knew what he wanted to do. He knew the picture he wanted to make. And there were 
there were blips and he was inclusive of those blips, but, you know, but really on a beam all the way. I think we were saying we wanted to get the movie, we needed to get the movie done. We needed to get to work because um, our, guy, our guys are losing their enthusiasm. It's going on too long. The movie won't be as good because our guys are getting so weary of waiting. They're losing their enthusiasm. And Jim said, oh, I don't, I, I don't accept that. Uh, I think when the trucks show up, you know, those big trucks show up, every, you, you get your enthusiasm back pretty quickly. I think, the, I think it'll be there. You know, they didn't really care for the longest time because for, they were making $100 a day in per diem. $700 a week, and that was more than they'd ever made in their lives. So they were living really high off the hog, relatively speaking. I saw James L. Brooks and Gracie Films and uh, in the building, and he saw me and said, oh, hey, man, and seemed very friendly. I said, hey, Jim, how's it going? He said, good, and talked to him for a minute, and he said, so when's Luke coming out? I just thought, oh, man, that's... Luke was also out there living with Owen, and they weren't paying him per diem. So he was getting really pissed off because he wanted the movie to go because he didn't get paid until the movie went. You know, we weren't trying to string our per diems along at the expense of... It wasn't like Jim Brooks was saying, I want to start the movie, here's the money, go to Dallas. And we were saying, no, let's, let's work on the script some more and get some more per diem. Luke and I would go golfing every day. Like he was teaching me how to golf, and it was like, that's what we did well. And then come back, and we'd both yell at them to get going faster, and then we'd go out and golf again. We did that until they finished it. <clears throat> that just seems to be the process at Gracie Films. There's going to be a long sort of period of, I guess, kind of developing the script. You know, it went two, two years without a page, and then it was like three weeks, there was a draft. And the draft did not incorporate any of the illustrations that I had given them, but it had accomplished every one of the notes that I, that I, that I had indicated, so, the, which were Jim's notes, but they were, but they didn't know how, what they meant. So this, the illustrations gave them an understanding of how to attack it. And they came in, and it was a brilliant script. It was a brilliant rewrite. And Jim gave us the green light to go do the movie. My first morning there, everybody was running around like, hey, we have a cup of coffee, you know? Introduced this one, this one I think I had to get in the first scene was in the car with Owen or something. And I kept looking at Owen, like, trying to figure out, what is this guy doing? What the heck is he doing? Owen's character is, like, is, is someone who has a romantic view of life and, and has been watching too many caper movies. And Luke tends to go along for the ride. So the guys didn't know that uh, those guns were loaded right on the field. Uh, no, they were, I cautioned them to be sure and aim at the dead tree because they were going to throw live bullets. <laughs> I kept asking what was a bottle rocket, you know, because I wanted to see bottle rockets in the movie, but I could never get Wes to do it. You know, he would not do it. I don't think that I even know, knew that it was that it was called Bottle Rocket at the beginning. I think it was just I just knew that they were working on a script together. I didn't I didn't uh, I didn't know the significance of the name, and I still don't. When we started the movie, Owen and I didn't know what a focus puller was, and so there was you know the camera and the camera operator, and then Wes and the sound guy, and then there was this guy John Boccaccio who you know, had the focus right here and he sat right beside the camera and he just had this kind of poker face. And after about the second day, Owen and I were like, this guy hates us. This guy thinks we're the biggest jerks. Success, total success. That was actually a looped line. Is it? Yeah, that was, I think, might have been from Jim Brooks. You know one of the great things about Jim Brooks um, that I'm always kind of um, amazed at when people come up and say they liked a particular line from Bottle Rocket. And a lot of times people will reference this one line where I blow up it, or I say, that's it, no more gang because Bob's messing with the gun and they're not paying attention. And then I walk off screen and Jim had this ADR line, how does an asshole like Bob get such a great kitchen? You can say, here's the situation with our characters. Here's the scene. This is happening. Could you have a joke? And he'll think for a second, and he'll say a joke. Maybe it's a 
good joke, maybe it's a great joke. Sometimes you just can't believe what he just said. And, it, it, and we would, uh, we got jokes from Jim. Let's get lucky. <laughs> Let's get lucky. Wes kept saying they're not slackers. They're always trying to find a way out. You know, I was trying to find a way to overcome. Owen said, I think we've got this part for you in the, in the feature uh, called Future Man, which sounded funny to me. So that's how I, uh, I, and he said the guy's just kind of supposed to kind of be from the future, futuristic. And it wasn't a particularly nuanced performance. <laughs> I, somebody told me, oh, Jim told me, you got to deliver the romance, buddy. That was a line I remember him saying to me. I just thought, Jesus, how do I do that? <laughs> it's Luke's movie because he's the center of the, of the movie. It's like, he's the one who ultimately learns the most. He's the one who takes the, the, the biggest journey. One of the pieces of music, we finished the session, and I was still thinking about it, and he said, what would it sound like on a steel, so, a steel string guitar? So. You know, we had him bring his guitar out, his other guitar, and he played it on another guitar. And it wasn't uncommon for him to want to hear things, you know, both an electric bass and uh, an acoustic bass. And um, I think there was a lot of just learning about how things sounded, you know. I would argue with him about cutaways. I mean, that Owen would run to the balcony of the motel and he would look down and see that Bob had taken the car, the, the, the Mercedes, and I wanted a point of view down at the empty parking space. He wouldn't shoot it. Wes was sp spending a lot of time cutting out pictures out of magazines or taking photographs, and he was, had this huge collage of material that had, on a pinup board that he had, was how he was thinking what would be the, the, um, the sets what would be, you know, the look that he was going for. He was actually creating a color scheme, which I thought was fascinating, because I'd never seen anyone do that. The locations were already in his mind, and we were, we were brought around to them, and then it was our job to just sort of add elements and, and just sort of make it cohesive and make, make it all work. But I certainly had a sense of what I wanted to be in the, in the picture. Uh, you know, I wanted, I wanted the frame to look like. I don't think I knew anything about how it ought to be lit. You know, Wes likes to put me in difficult positions photographically and very challenging. And um, so we always just found a way to do it. There was never any l limitation with Bob where he couldn't shoot in this space. There was no room small, too small, or... There were very um, few sets in that movie. Yeah. He really gets Wes, and in, in terms of the, the visual, uh, the rest of Wes is a mystery to all of us. Somebody told me that um, Jim Brooks wanted to see me for, talk to me about something, and I went over and we talked, and then he told me he has these kids down there in Texas, and they're doing this film, and you know, they would love it if, you know, you would, three days and I would love it. The sense of legitimacy came when we heard that, that James Caan was going to be in it. That's when it kind of seemed like it was a real, you know, a real movie with real actors. And I didn't know, you know, much about who this guy was, this character, you know, so there wasn't a lot of, like, great amount of preparation. So I, I, I called on one of my great resources, which is the knack to bullshit, you know, just to, to you know, to, to exaggerate everything. And I figured, you know, Mr. Henry. Yeah, I was supposed to be kind of insulting, uh, insulting my brother Bob and, and Jimmy kind of grabs my wrist and he, he, he is kind of a karate expert and he did, he did some kind of move where it's, where he bent my thumb kind of back around towards my wrist and it really did hurt like crazy. Do I think my craft was improved? Nah. Not at that time, I don't think. <laughs> I, there was no room for improvement. You know what I mean? Then we started the process of um, previewing it. And it was a horrendous preview. It's in the lore that we had the worst scores ever. And it was really depressing. It just kind of seemed to uh, 
not go well and lots of people walked out to where it seemed <clears throat> kind of a shocking number of people walked out. Other than this one person who filled out a comment card that we really liked, um, Mark was the, only, was the only person who seemed to have really enjoyed it and he didn't really seem that aware of the fact that somebody, he had noticed that a lot of people left the theater during the screening but he didn't particularly interfere with his experience of the movie. You know, they finished their popcorn, they finished their soda, and they just got up and left. You know, I still remember those first cards hearing back, like... What, what kinds of things were on those cards? Just like, this sucks, and this wasn't a James Conn comedy. They were, they were saying things like, um, why didn't we see her breasts? I, I, there was one that said, just had scrawled on it, this is shit. Those were the kind of, of uh, complaints that, that uh, the test group had for the film. <laughs> you don't want to hear that from a person that got to see uh, your movie free. But you know, I, I, all the pieces were there. It just was, he just was not dealing with pace. I mean, it was really slow. It was so painful trying to cut that film down to a good running time and it was like we were tearing Wes's guts out. There was this whole scene that we filmed of being chased through the yard by the cops and all, you know, uh, several scenes that follow, actually, that ended up getting cut from the film. We had a whole sequence where Kumar had plates rolling, you know, going around on, on balanced on a stick. So that was out. Our whole idea was to submit it to Sundance where their short had been. And, um, and that would be in this small budget picture, the first leg up, get some attention there, do that circuit, do, you know, which so many people do. And Sundance turned it down. Wes was very, you know, devastated and pissed off. That does seem unbelievable because we had the short there and Wes and I did that summer uh, workshop at Sundance. I mean, it made me crazy. So I felt like a complete failure. Yeah, there, it was kind of, kind of an uncomfortable time. I knew it was a great film and I just felt we had the wrong audiences. But, but I will say that every time we did do a screening, or almost every time, there was at least one person in the audience who seemed to appreciate it. I don't think I'll ever be around a better review in my life than the LA Times, which not only loved the picture, I think, Kenny Turan, I believe, not only loved the picture, but took off on Sundance for how dare they turn this down? What's wrong with Sundance? And that was, it's like a miracle that happened in a review in a major newspaper. Every once in a while, you know, I think I've done 78 or 79 movies, they'll say, I loved you in Bottle Rocket. It made many 10 best lists. A lot of people love that movie. Over the years, you know, it's, it's like um, the picture made cult. The film has somehow been discovered. Yeah. And I've even had people check it out. You know, I mean, we know the, the cult movies of the last 50 years, you know. And I think Bottle Rocket is one of them. And like I said, we're getting on 15 years ago. That's when we did this movie. And people still are asking about it. This is a new voice. This is a... This is... A great film. It seems like something that uh, kind of came sort of like from a family. You know, my best friend directing, and my brother is in it, and my friends. And you gotta deliver the romance, buddy. Or maybe Owen is Dignan. I don't know. Maybe, maybe he is Dignan. Now that I think about it, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I love that character. Yeah, I think it's a great character. If Wes Anderson were to call me, and asked me to be in a movie, I'd jump at it. You know, because it was fun. Abe Henry's hideout, which was a, a spot of great importance to me, was right there. And it's been torn down, but I, uh, I didn't forget. I didn't forget about, uh, about the robbery. I don't play characters, I am a character. Whatever you want in the life, you have to work for it. 
You know, now look, Wes is a big time director, you know, and he hasn't called me either, that son of a bitch. You know what I mean? Thank <laughs> you.